Well, welcome to the Speak With People podcast. My name is Jason Rates, and I'm so excited you're joining us today. We believe that healthy communication is oxygen for our relationships and our leadership. So whether you communicate one-on-one, to a team, from a stage, or from behind the screen, your communication matters. Uh, Your communication is your leadership currency. And if used correctly, when we choose healthy communication, you'll become an effective, empathetic, and captivating communicator. So today, we have an incredible show planned. We have an incredible leader that we're going to interview. And this is a leader that I followed for a little while now online, and I'm so honored to be able to have them. But John Maxwell says that uh, if you have influence, you have some leadership. And so if you are a leader, you are going to get a lot out of this podcast episode. At some point of every leader's career, we have to figure out how important communication is and especially how important effective communication is because effective communication is an absolute must as a leader. When you lead a team, an organization, a board, your communication is absolutely vital to your success and your team's success. So how do you communicate effectively? Is it even possible to communicate to everyone we need to? Is it possible to keep everybody in the know? Do you communicate differently to the different teams that you lead? What practices should you employ as a leader to communicate? Those are just some of the questions that we're going to answer and some of the things that we're going to be able to dive in. And so we have this incredible leader. He is the founding and executive director of Branches Worldwide. He wrote a book called Authentic Leadership. He is just a great speaker and leader. I want to welcome Dan Olabi to the Speak With People podcast. Welcome, Dan. It's good to be here. How you doing, Jason? Doing really, really well. Thank you so much for taking some time. Hey, so for our listeners, could you just give us a little bit of your story, your your background, your family, what you do, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll give you a little bit about me. Um, so fun fact, one thing that a lot of people don't know unless they've read the book is that um, I'm a CODA. So I have two deaf parents, meaning I'm fluent in sign language. My dad passed away years ago, but uh, fluent in sign language and having grown up in in that community. When uh, when the the movie Coda won an Oscar on Apple Plus, uh, it was like a it was a big moment. I was like, oh, wow. Hey, other people kind of know what this is. So, wow. Um, I, uh, you know, I I lead an international nonprofit that works with Christian entrepreneurs around the world. I'm a public speaker. I'm an author. I kind of live at the intersection of faith and leadership. So Mm. I'm a teaching pastor at my local church. Um, You know, there's a a lot that that I love to do. Um, But ultimately, I think one of the most important roles that I play is as a husband and as a father. Mm. Um, I remember uh, learning a long time ago that if you can't lead your family, you can't lead anybody. Mm. And so the litmus test for your effectiveness as a leader is whether you can lead your kids and your spouse. And so that's where I'm at. That's where I really put my money. Wow. That's absolutely incredible. I was uh, sitting in church on Sunday and the pastor was talking about fatherhood and he talked about Mm. how fatherhood was, you know, being able to create a life that, you know, your kids would want to follow. And you just, you know, hammered that right on the, Right on the nail. It's such a such a good reminder, uh, especially. Well, kind of diving into this conversation. I mean, you you like you said, you lead an international organization. You do a lot of upfront communication. You do a lot of behind the scenes communication. So I'm really excited for this conversation. When it comes to effective communication, being an effective communicator as a leader, how how would you define that? How would you say, hey, these are some of the characteristics or habits that a leader employs when they are effectively communicating? Yeah, that's a good question, Jason. I love the idea of this podcast because I think it really gets at the heart of one of the most important components of a leader. The the most important thing that a leader can do is convey understanding. Mm. I think when people get it and they're like, I I see, you know, when their eyes are open, teachers talk about like the light bulb going on or people talk about being woke or the aha moment. Like all that is really trying to get at this like moment of clarity this moment of understanding where once you see it, you can't unsee it. And once you see it, it animates all your actions from that point on. Wow. And so people don't need to be pushed when they understand, like when they understand, they get it. They're like, like they're running towards it. And so a leader can get a lot done if they're just effective in helping people understand. Like that's, that's yeah. the primary thing. What do you, you know, so, so many leaders, we, we have the choice uh, at speak with people. We like to say, you know, your communication, you just hit on this as well. Your communication is your currency. And so as a leader, 
if you're going to inspire people, you're going to get them to go from point A to B, you're going to bring them along with you, you know, you've got to communicate. And so every leader has that choice. You can communicate in healthy ways or you can communicate in unhealthy ways. Why do you think so many leaders sometimes tend to fall in the unhealthy category with their communication? Like, do you have any thoughts around that? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, you're right. There is a, There are a lot of unhealthy patterns. Like there's the obvious, you know, like a description of an unhealthy communication pattern would be like yelling, like the aggressive mm. side. Right. Or there's the, the, pa- the passive side where, you, you know, you know this, where you just don't, you don't actually say anything. You just kind of hope the problem goes away. You hope they just, right. they, they'll figure it out, you know? Right. And then like, yeah, yeah, you see that. And then there's like, there's like the passive aggressive side where you're just like, what did he mean? Why is he always so sarcastic? Does he like me or does he not? Like, is he in this or is he not? You yeah. know, like those are the things that um, I think poor leaders really lean into. Um, and so, yeah, I think when it comes to negative, uh, negative forms of communication, I think you see a lot of people doing that primarily because they just don't know the effect mm. of what they're doing. You know, I think it's it's easy to just kind of communicate the way that you've been communicated to without yep. fully understanding what's happening in other people's head when you talk that way. Yep. And so I think if people fully understood their uh, the consequences of poor communication, they would change. Oh, wow. Wow. Where for your for your life and your leadership, you know, who are some of those strong examples for you uh, either growing up or in your early years of leadership that helped you? you know, make sure you're employing healthy, effective communication in your leadership? I love that question, uh, especially because we talked about being a CODA, um, a children of deaf adults. Uh, wow. So my mom and dad were both, like I said, deaf, but they were both were sign language professors. So they both taught at the local university. Um, and one of the things that I learned from them was how hard they had to work to get mm. other people to understand what they were saying. I mean, it just was wow. a lot of effort. Right. And so my mom, even right now, currently teaches a class full of hearing kids, right, uh, at the University of Louisville. And, you know, she's animated, she's writing on the board, she's, you know, she's using nonverbal communication, all that to really get them to understand a concept. And so I saw them put tremendous effort, not just in communicating an idea, but getting people to feel something Mm. when they said something. And as a deaf person, you've got to go over and above and beyond. You can't just, you know, play around the edges. You have to really dive into communication to really get people to understand. So I saw that, took that to heart and realized there's a lot of work, but the payoff is huge on the other side. Wow. Wow. I, yeah, we, um, the church I pastored years ago in, in central Michigan, we had a couple that was, uh, uh, deaf and, just getting to know them and just what you talked about, some of the challenges, you know, the, the things that we take for granted so often uh, is, is just incredible to watch them continue to just move forward. And, you know, it's just, you know, so incredibly important. Now, did you have someone in your early leadership years as you were, you know, kind of forming some of your, your effective communication style that kind of modeled the opposite of it? I don't want you to throw anybody under the bus, but, you know, I know sometimes, you know, we, we are also formed by some of those years where we go, I'm not going to lead like that someday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, let me let me let me round that out, though, with the people who I thought were really good. Um, I remember listening to a talk one time. And I heard uh, heard Erwin McManus mm. preach. And I think when I left and him and um, uh, uh, Craig Rochelle, I think when I left both of those talks, I was like, those guys are the best I've ever seen. <laughs> like best I've ever, I mean, just from beginning to end, like yep. it's like somebody turned the lights on and you just can't look away. Yep. And so, you know, those guys, you know, and there's a lot of ladies out there who do the same thing, but those guys I think really captivated my attention as well. I think, you know, when it comes to poor communicators, I've definitely worked for people who um, not only thought they were communicating very clearly, but got defensive about mm-hmm. their, their communication skill. And so when you would point out like, hey, I don't think that's very clear, you know, it was almost like, well, I said it clearly, you must not have heard it very well. Right. And <laughs> I, right. Think, I think just just like an essential part of communication is like the onus is on the communicator, not on the listener. Like right. you have to just bend over backwards to get people to understand. And if they don't understand, sometimes it's because they don't want to understand. I get it. But sure. you still have to keep working. Like that that right. is a you thing, not a them thing. Yep. So. 
<laughs> yeah, I love it when uh, a leader could go and pitch the same thing to a bunch of different groups, and each group still has that kind of dazed and confused. And at some point, the leader has to go, there's one part of this equation <laughs> that seems That's to right. add up every time. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I had a friend who say one time, he'd say, look, like if everybody in the room keeps telling you that you have a tail, at the very least, turn on and look. It's, <laughs> just just check. Just check to see if they're they're right. Oh, that's so good. Uh, so in your role now, could you just kind of give us, you know, a, a couple of the different venues or the, you know, the different teams that you have to communicate to? Because I know that, you know, it's a different communication across the board. And so, you know, either people groups or you know, different communication functions, you know, that you have to communicate across the, the spectrum to. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can give you a bunch of them. Um, so let's start off the top, the highest level of keynote speeches. You're talking to 15,000 people in an auditorium. So that's a different level of communication mm. where you have to bring the energy and you have to have the whole thing scripted and you have to bring people on a journey. So all that is, that is important. That's rare. Oh. Most people don't speak to that many people. Most people are terrified. They'd rather die than speak to that many people. Right. Usually. And so... They just stay away from that. Um, and, you know, I think for me, I love speaking. I really enjoy public speaking. I really get into it. But I recognize your credibility comes from being able to lead a team. Mm. And so then you take it to another level. The team at Branches Worldwide, I lead them day to day, day in and day out. I've got a day job, um, answering emails, doing one-on-ones. And so those are the opportunities to set direction, to really yep. connect with them as individuals, to check for understanding, to, you know, answer questions, to set vision. Um, so those are conversations I have on a regular basis. And then maybe to put it in the middle, um, not just the, you know, the team that you lead on the ground or mm -hmm. the 15,000, you know, huge auditoriums, but you know, that middle level, uh, where you're talking to groups of 15 or 20, um, branches worldwide is set up where we have cohorts that meet from around the world. So I'm talking to somebody from Tanzania, but then also somebody from Thailand wow. and, you know, really trying, trying to figure out how to communicate an idea so that it really resonates with them you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, but then also somebody in Central Asia. So really trying to think about people. What are the, what's the common denominator between entrepreneur leadership across multiple continents? Like those are the things I have to think wow. about on a regular basis in order to be effective as a communicator. Wow, man, that's fantastic. Let me drill in just something you said there. So when you're leading staff and leading one-on-ones, uh, how do you approach, you know, uh, that leadership with them? Th th those conversations, you know, when you have to bring up, you know, different areas that you need to see improvement for them or, you know, areas where you need to go, okay, hey, we, we've got to really hit this target. You know, what goes into your communication as you kind of prepare yourself to lead them that way? I'd love to be able to drill into mm. that a little bit. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, obviously it starts with hiring the right people. Right. You know, people who want to improve, continuous improvement is part of their DNA. You don't have to instill those values in them. And so then when it comes to the hard conversation, you really are able to couch it in a way that says, hey, look, like there's a problem. The mm -hmm. problem isn't with you. The problem is with this thing. And let's both of us get shoulder to shoulder and see if we can figure this thing out. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something in your behavior. It's not a you thing as like a, you know, your soul, but maybe it's a habit that you've picked up over the years that we both together can put our heads together and try to figure out. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a challenge outside of the organization you know, outside of two of us that we're trying to tackle that we just need to strategize for. But I think when you have people who are interested in continuous improvement, mm. then you can get shoulder to shoulder and say, hey, let's improve here. Let's yep. do this together. I'll help you, you know, and let's get better. So uh, is Branches a nonprofit then? It is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. we've got a for-profit arm, um, okay. but yeah, the, the core of it's a nonprofit. So then you have a board, right? Mm -hmm. So walk, walk with us for a second about some of the board communication that you have to do regularly. Cause I know we have listeners who lead nonprofits and, you know, work on boards. And, and I know that, you know, it, it is a different level of leadership when you, you know, as the director, you, you know, are sitting with them shoulder to shoulder, but you're also leading them. You're communicating in a way for the whole organization. We just love, yeah. Any of your thoughts on the communication that goes into, you know, that board leadership. Hmm. I threw you for a That's on a that great one. question. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I'm actually I'm prepping myself because I'm going to say something controversial, and the okay. board might hear it. I'm going to I'm going to say it anyway because <laughs> I think it's true. I think I think a very healthy board works for the executive director. Mm. I think that that's that's the reality, and I think oftentimes, too often, the executive director or the CEO of a nonprofit thinks that they work for the board. 
Mm. And technically they do. They can be fired. I can be fired, which is healthy and accountability yep. is good. Absolutely. But I think the board is, is there to see you win. Mm. They really want to help. And so your job is to give them enough information to make a good decision to give you perspective. And so when you give regular reporting or wow. you show them not just the positives, but also the negatives, and you trust that they have your best interest at heart, they want, yep. they're working for you. That's why they're there. They want to see you win. Then you're able to give them regular communication without feeling like they're looking over your shoulder or something like that. So I think it really starts with saying like, these guys are for me. Like they're yes. here to like help me succeed. So I need to give them all the information. And that means regular reporting. That means talking transparency, coming to, for example, um, having reports a week in advance of the meeting so that they right. can look it over and then show up to the meeting with questions as opposed to learning the content for the first time, you know, things like that. It's it's so fascinating, and sometimes it slips us because in leadership we're moving, we got so many things going on, but uh, clear communication, whether it's good or bad, it really does breathe life into the organization, in the relationships. And so, I sat on a, you know, I led a nonprofit about twelve years ago, and you know, twelve years ago my leadership probably wasn't where it was today, and I I would have a hard time dispensing the bad news. And finally, a board member had to sit me down and say, hey, listen, good or bad, we need to know. And so if more boards would be able to grab hold of that identity that you just talked about, we are we are in this together. We're for the director. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I have the tendency to believe that most leaders are running on like a, a quarter tank, you know, of their with their encouragement tanks. And so mm. a lot of times mm. leaders go into board meetings or, you know, lead team meetings or whatever it is, and they're already beat up. They're already waiting for the arrows. But if we had those kind of healthy boards where we could go in and say, okay, we're in this together. Let's improve together. Here's the information, good or bad. You know, that's, that's so yeah. powerful. I mean, that's just gold. Uh, so I, no, I, I, that's well said. Well said. appreciate you going, going off a little bit there. That was, <laughs> that was good. Mm. Uh, yeah. So as, as you lead people in teams, it's going to happen, you know, drama flares at times, you know, uh, this leader gets upset because maybe they, they weren't in the know or they wanted this promotion and, and, you know, they're tired of hearing about the things that are happening from other people. You know, when we have employees that, you know, or team members that complain about not being in the know, like, how do we, how, how do we remedy that? How do we make sure that the right people are in the know, you know, what are some ways that we can help make sure our teams are communicated with? And I, I know that goes right back to just being an effective leader, yeah, effective communicator as a leader, but yeah, I would love some of your thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, and I'm, I'm really glad that you, you thought of this question because I think it really gets to the core of organizational leadership. I think mm. organizational leadership really comes down to making sure that everybody kind of understands what the marching orders are and there's no room for uh, miscommunication because ultimately yeah. what happens is when somebody doesn't understand something or they feel like they didn't get clear instruction, then that leaves room for a lack of accountability. We're like, well, I didn't get it in the first place. How was I supposed right. to do it? How can you hold me accountable to something I didn't even know I was supposed to do in the first place? And now right. you're like, as a leader, you know, you're just, you're fighting with one arm because they're like, why well, didn't, why didn't you make it clear to start with, you know? Right. So you, you're really hitting on something that's important. Obviously, there's there's three different things that you can think about. I mean, there's cascading communication where, you know, if you're in a large organization, you have the CEO or the executive that sends out an email and then his direct reports underneath that sort of craft the own, their own email based on what that guy said or what that lady said, and then send it down to their team. So everyone's yep. responsible for communicating the essence in a way that everybody understands. That's one way to do it. Another way is to do an all hands on meeting where you just kind of say everything to everybody at one one time. You know, you say, hey, this is this is what the organization is mm. doing next. Any questions? Kind of like a town hall. Yep. Another one is doing doing regular videos, you know, where you send out, you know, regular updates and letting people know, hey, here are the changes that we're making. Right. Email, email me if you have any questions. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. I think you said it earlier, Jason, though. The key is, it, I don't know if you meant to alliterate this way, but I'll, I, I'll, I'll give you credit for it. Okay. The, the, the key is, is this clear, consistent communication. Mm. I mean, the, the clarity part is really important. Like John Maxwell says it over and over again. He's like, look, at the very least, at the, the very least, the most essential thing is be clear. Yep. Don't be like, don't be cute. You know, don't right. be clever. Right. Just, just say it. Like, be right. clear. We are, <laughs> we are running into a fiscal cliff. We have to, <laughs> or we have to raise $50,000 in the next right. two days. Like, just be clear and then be so consistent. Good. And then, you know, that communication piece. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, we want to, 
you know, especially those of us more on the, the artsy side of life and personality at times. You know, I'm a four on the Enneagram. So, you know, the creativity and the romanticism and, you know, hence yeah. kind of my background of, you know, eclectic images. You know, sometimes, yeah, we want to do that. And I, I, I keep coming back to Story Brand by Donald Miller over and over. And he's just like, what you just said, stop being cute. Make sure people understand. <laughs> Yep, yep. Show them the button to press, like lead them by yes. the nose, make it make it stupid clear. So yes. there's zero excuse. The point of communication is accountability. So right. everybody's like, we understand. Like that's that's the primary point of it. That's so good. So uh, as we're leading our teams, you know, there are going to be moments where some drama and conflict, you know, do pop up. You know, as a as a team leader, you know, how how do you deal with that when it happens? You know, typically the person I found who's, you know, kind of spearheading the drama, you know, maybe they're starting to say things around the office like, well, I didn't know about this and I can't believe this and, you know, those kind of things. So take us through what you do, uh, you know, when those kind of situations uh, happen when it comes to, you know, communicating with them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a big, that's a big issue. I think that's something that really, um, derails a lot of great leaders because mm. the drama and the the frustration around culture that kind of stuff that can be just hard to quantify so it's really hard to know where it's coming from um one of the things that we do to nip that in the bud within branches and we do that with all of our leaders across 17 continents is that we we talk very specifically about um the five trust commitments we pulled this from a bunch of different people but mm. um essentially it's it's basically saying, look, in any relationship you have, whether it's with you and your spouse or you and your mom or you and your dad or you and your boss or you and a coworker, there's always going to be gaps between mm. what they do and what you expected them to do or what, what, what you expected and what you actually experienced in regards to the relationship. There's always going to be gaps. Yep. So they said they were going to do something and they didn't do it the way you thought they were going to do it. And that happens all the time. But the reality is we get to choose what we put in that gap. And oftentimes people will have the option between either choosing trust. Mm -hmm. I'm going to trust that even though I don't fully understand something, yeah. I'm going to give them the best interest or the, the benefit of the doubt. Um, or we fill it with suspicion, trust or suspicion. And what you find oh, is good. that gossipers uh, will tend to fill it with suspicion really quick. Oh, you yeah. know what? Jason was late. I don't know why he was late, but I'm assuming it's because he doesn't like <laughs> right. doesn't value our company. He's, he's looking for another job. He's, probably cheating on me. He's did it, you know, yep. all of this stuff when you don't, you don't actually know the, the truth, but you fill that gap with suspicion and that yep. leads to all kinds of other problems. So we've laid out five very clear rules for organization. Mm. And we say, look, like here are the five trust commitments. Like for example, uh, here's number one. I say this like literally every week. And so I have it memorized, but number one is you know, when there's a gap between what I expected from you and what I'm actually experiencing from you, I will fill that gap with trust. Wow. Like, so wow. you don't have to worry that like, you know, if something happens and, uh, you know, maybe I'm upset or something like that, you have to worry that I'm mad at you. Like, I'm going to fill that gap with trust. I'm going to assume the best about you. And then one of the other rules is if there's a gap, I'm actually going to go directly to you about it and say, hey, Jason, you showed up late. I'm not mad at you, not frustrated. I just want to know there's a gap here and I'm actually coming to you and asking you what happened. And so we use that to like, wow. you know, um, to nip it in the bud. Yeah. Oh, that's absolutely incredible because we, you know, so many leaders I know have, have been at, uh, have been a part of organizations where that gap just grows and grows and grows and grows. And then the frustration. Yep. And if we just did yep. that, you know, as, as, as easy or hard as it is at times it would be absolutely right. incredible. Uh, and then what happens, you're, you're 100% right, then what happens is that people, you know, people get fired or people quit and walk away. And yep. people are like, what happened? You know, well, it's because right. for years people have been filling the gap with suspicion and no right. one said Never saw it coming. It. Well, <laughs> right. It doesn't take much emotional intelligence to be able to feel when that relationship mm -hmm. starts to get off and off and off. Yeah. So that's right. that, that's that right. speaks to, you know, there's got to be a good amount of authenticity in a leader to be able to have, you know, that mm -hmm. type of conversation. How important, you know, is it to our communicate? How important is authenticity, transparency, vulnerability to our communication as leaders? No, oh, man, it is, it is critical. It's amazing how human beings just as like, just as like, you know, animals can sense 
like when someone else is being inauthentic, like we can smell it. You know yeah. what I mean? And so uh, Craig Rochelle says this, well, he might've pulled this from somewhere else, but he said that people will, will always follow a leader who is more real than a mm. leader who is always right. Right. So people will always follow a leader who's always real than one who's always right. And I feel like when leaders lean into that realness, like, Hey, I'm just being, I'm just being as honest as I possibly can be not necessarily, you know, over communicating or, um, saying things that are unnecessary, but just talking in a way that's truthful and helpful and necessary for the moment. Yep. When a leader can do that, people just grab on. That's like refreshing. That's like, yes, honestly. And I think this is not a political statement, but I think one of the reasons why people are gravitating towards Donald Trump is because no one in the world could ever say this guy is not telling you exactly what he thinks. <laughs> like it is everything that comes out of his mouth is like, yes, he yep. believes that 100%. Yep. Like, and yep. so that authenticity, whether you believe his politics or not, like yep. people are like, I, I, I'm getting what I'm getting, you know? Right. So, right. He does not leave you for, you know, with any questions. Dave Chappelle says Donald Trump is a honest liar because you're like, that's gotta be a lie. <laughs> but no, he's just being, this is just his honest self, you know? <laughs> yeah. He's saying, he's saying exactly what he believes to be true. And I yep. think people are, some people find that refreshing. I mean, some people find that repulsing, you know, just whatever, but the authenticity piece um, I mean, that's there and that, that just naturally for some people just really like that, that's the hook. Like I don't have to worry about, you know, this guy thinking something that he's not saying, you know? Oh yeah, absolutely. Could you, uh, just as a little plug before we, you know, we, we finish up this, uh, this, uh, interview, uh, could you just tell us a little bit about, uh, your book? Uh -huh. You have the book right there. Look I at do. you. Wow. I do. Wow. Look at that. Ten points. <laughs> Ten points for you. Ten points for you. Thank you very I much. Like <laughs> no, I, I, you know, once I, I saw it on your website, I was like, I have to get this, you know, to get ready for this interview and been reading through it. And I mean, I, I just, even the tagline grabs you, how to lead with nothing to hide, nothing to prove, nothing to lose. I mean, that authenticity, I mean, leaders are just, you know, people are, are just hungry for that. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm 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 glad that you said that. I think you know the book was was a labor of love. I really enjoyed it. It came from an, my own personal experience of being inauthentic, and then having been a pastor for so long, and seeing so many people in my room in my office come to me and say things to me that they would never tell anyone else. They'd never tell their spouse. They'd never tell their parents. They'd never tell anybody. And most of the time, they were just ridiculously insecure. Yeah constantly with something to hide, something to prove and something to lose. And so what I found, especially with business leaders, I found that over and over every room they walk into, people think they're 10 feet tall and bulletproof and they have to act that way mm. again and again and again. It was sabotaging their ability to actually lead with energy and effectiveness. And so I wrote the book, you know, starting with my own experience, but also doing a ton of research and then writing specifically for people who are in a leadership position that don't see insecurity coming. They just almost don't wow. think it should happen to them. And when it does, they're like, what's wrong with me? You know, and yep. <laughs> well, it happens to everyone and you've got right. to handle it. So the book teaches you how to do it. Oh, it's fantastic. And the, in, the insecurity thing, I mean, so many people think, well, that leader is not insecure. No, actually, that, you know, they're dealing with it. It's their shadow mission. And uh... shadow mission. I love that. I love that. I <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a great concept. I preached on that one time. That is so good. Yep. I, yep. I, I learned it from John Artberg. So, you know, obviously I'm, yep. I'm just a learner, but oh man, when He's you, when you book, start yeah. identify those shadow missions and you're like, okay, that's, that's me. I need, this is where I need health. This is where I need authenticity. So powerful. Well, Dan, it. this has been it. incredible. I mean, thank you so much for pouring out, giving us some wisdom before I let you go. Just a couple of rapid fire questions. People can kind of keep getting to know you, but is there a podcast right now that, you know, you either really much enjoy, either it's helping you grow as a leader or it's just, you know, it's just fun for you to listen to? Yeah, yeah. So the one that I listen to probably more often than not is called Presidential. Mm -hmm. um, it's one that it's actually, I think they stop producing new episodes or they do it every periodically or whatever, but it's basically a deep dive into every president in the United States. I was a history major um, a couple different oh. times and I, I love it because they give you just like, hey, here's what here's what Chester Arthur was thinking, you know? And I'm like, yeah, like give me more of that. So again, that, 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 that's a nerdy thing. Yeah. Nothing to do with, uh, a little bit to do with leadership for sure, but nothing to do with my ministry and the work I'm doing right now. So Absolutely. Uh, you've traveled the world. What's been the favorite country so far that you visited? Yeah, a favorite country. There's a lot of beautiful places 
Thailand, uh, Tanzania. I was in Kenya a couple weeks ago, heading to um, Zimbabwe in about a week and a half. Wow. So a lot of really beautiful places. Um, the place I loved the most, though, was Costa Rica, specifically last September. I took my family there, and my girls had never been out of the country before. Mm. And so just, you know, just we're not we, – we don't do soft landings. You know, we do hard landings. So, like, we're going to rent a car in Costa Rica. Or we're going to drive. We're going to go buy food at the grocery store. I mean, so we're just going to wow. kind of live life as Costa Ricans. Yeah. And my girls, you know, having them experience that, they're 10 and 7 – I've been experiencing that authentic experience outside the country was, was good for me. So I'd say Costa Rica. That's amazing. Well, again, Dan, thank you so much for being a part of the Speak With People podcast today. Before I let you go, could you just tell us, you know, where we could find you online, you know, where we could look you up that way? Yeah, absolutely. So you can go to um, branchesworldwide.org. Um, there's a lot of information about the work that we do with entrepreneurs around the world. Um, you can also find on that page, there's information about me and speaking and things like that. You can go to amazon.com. My book is on there. Um, there's also another workbook that I recently just came out with. And so the workbook is available on Amazon as well. Um, so those are the easy places. And then if you go to Facebook, um, I've got a large following there. If you go to Instagram or go to LinkedIn, you can find me, Dan Owalabi. Owalabi. Perfect. Well, Thank you, Dan, for being a part. And we will uh, link all of all the things that we talked about uh, in the show notes. And so people have uh, all of that available. So thank you again. Really appreciate your time. And thank you, listeners, for being a part of the Speak With People podcast. Just before I let you go, uh, if you are wanting to be a more effective, empathetic, and captivating speaker, but you don't know where to start, you, you don't get in front of people all that often, but you want to be ready for when you do, Speak With People has written uh, the public speaking pathway. It will help you with, with whatever place of the journey you are on, become a more effective, empathetic, captivating communicator. Just head to speakwithpeople.com slash pathway. You can download a free ebook there that will help you become that kind of communicator that you want to be. And thank you so much for being a part of this podcast community. Don't forget, we have a Facebook group. Just search the Speak With People community on Facebook. And every day we're putting in different resources and videos and podcasts to help you grow as a communicator so you can change your world with your words. Again, this podcast exists because we really do believe our words matter. We believe healthy communication is oxygen for our relationships and our leadership. So whether you communicate one-on-one -on -one to a team from a stage or from behind the screen, we hope that our time today encourages you to choose to communicate in healthy ways. We know that you will change your world for the better as you do. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you next week on the Speak With People podcast.